May God show kindness and bless us and make his face shine on us. Then the earth will acknowledge your ways and all nations your power to save. Let the people praise you, God. Let all the people praise. Let the nations rejoice and sing for joy. For you judge the world with justice. You judge the peoples with fairness. You guide the nations on earth. Let the people praise you, God. Let all the people praise you. The earth has yielded its produce. God, our God, has blessed us. May God continue to bless us and be revered by the whole wide world. We have gathered this morning to praise and to give thanks. And we sing of that in hymn number 14, Now Thank We All Our God. Will you please stand and sing with us? I hope you all are doing well. I'm glad you're here. Yeah, everybody looks so nice. This morning, I want to teach you what I think may be the hardest thing to say. Okay? It's only three words that you need to learn how to say, but they are very, very hard for people to say. In fact, you might have an easier time saying them than your parents and your grandparents out there. Okay? Okay? Now, when we're real little, when we first learn how to talk, we know how to say these words, and they kind of come very easy. But about the time we're maybe two years old, is everybody here over two? Yeah, you are. All of you are older than two. We kind of forget how to say these words, and I don't know why that is, but we forget how to say them. I'm going to show you something first, or ask you a question. What if... Caitlin, I asked you to move that piano. We're not going to do it because Mr. Tim would probably be mad at me if we moved the piano, but what if, we, what if I asked you by yourself to move the piano? Do you think you could do it? You, you couldn't? But, but I really need the piano moved a little bit. How would you do it? You might push it, but do you think you might be able to do it all by yourself? It's kind of heavy. I, I'm not even real sure that I could do it by myself. But if I asked one of you to do it, what if you couldn't do it? 
what would you do next? Would you ask for help? You would ask for help. That that's something we need to do. We need to move the piano, so, and I can't do it all by myself, so I'll ask for help. Three hardest words for people to say are, I need help. Now, as I said, when you were real little, when you're le- a couple of years old or so, you knew how to say, I needed help. But after a while, we forget, and we want to say what? I'll do it myself. Have you ever said that to your mom or dad? Never. I bet we have. That you go to tie your shoe and you'll say, no, I'll do it all by myself. Or you'll reach something, I'll do it all by myself. Well, some things you can do by yourself, but it is very, very important to always be able to say, I need help. Some of you all are in school. All of you are in school right now. Has your teacher ever given you an assignment that you couldn't do by yourself? Never? Wow, y'all are smart and strong. Yeah. Your teacher is there to give you help. And it's always, it's always a good idea for you to tell your teacher that you need help or your mom or your dad that you need help. You can even come to me and tell me that you need help. Probably not a good idea for you to ask me to help you with your math homework. I'm not so good at math, but I'm here to help you. Ms. Aaron is here to help you. Mr. Doug and Mr. Tim, they're here to help you. Everybody out here is here to help you as well. Yes, Mr. Doug is your daddy. He's here to help you a lot, okay? And I want, this morning, I want you to help me a little bit, okay? This week, if you see your parents doing something that maybe they need some help with, I want you to remind them and say, Mom, Dad, it's okay for you to say I need help. Let's pray together. Dear Lord, every one of us needs help through life. We need help understanding you. We need help serving you. And I pray, Lord, that you would help us to look to you and say that we need help, that we need our friends, that we need our family to help us. It's always okay. It's always good for us to ask for help. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Thank you for helping me this morning. Healing. God of healing, we bring our prayers to you. Our prayers at this moment are not those we prayed yesterday, nor are they the ones we will pray tomorrow. For we are a little farther along than we were yesterday, and we are not where we will be tomorrow. Some of us are a bit stronger, some a little more fragile. In our strongest moments, and in our weakest ones, your spirit heals us in ways we do not understand. Remind the sad and lonely that you do not despise a broken heart, but welcome its tears. Remind the fearful ones that fragile people shall yet dream dreams. Remind those aching for others that one day the lame shall leap for joy, the blind shall see, and the deaf shall hear. What can we believe, O God? That the touch of your mercy will ease our pain and your spirit will help us care. That the strength of your healing comes in the midst of our deepest heartaches, in our shining joys, and in our crushing sorrows. God, whose steadfastness outshines the sun We lean on your steady love.
Hear now this reading from the book of John, chapter 5. After this, there was a festival of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now, in Jerusalem, by the Sheep Gate, there is a, cool, a pool called Beth Zatha, which has five porticos. In these lay many invalids, blind, lame, and paralyzed. One man was there who had been ill for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew he had been there a long time, he said to him, do you want to be made well? The sick man answered him, sir, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. And while I am making my way, someone else steps down ahead of me. Jesus said to him, Stand up, take your mat, and walk. At once the man was made well, and he stood, he stood up and took his mat and began to walk. Now that day was a Sabbath. This is the word of God for the people of God. Let us pray. Our God of great love, we read your word this day and are reminded of who we are. We are the invalids. We are blind. We are lame. We are paralyzed. Lord, though we seek to follow you, so often we lose our way blinded by our own drives, desires, and ambitions. Too often, Lord, do we fall behind like the lame might do, moving too slowly, too cautiously, failing for fear of falling to keep up with you as you lead the way for your kingdom among us. And who among us, O oh Lord, has not been so injured, so hurt by life, as at times to be truly paralyzed by deep despair, anxiety, uncertainty, or even fear. Lord, you ask us, do you want to be healed? O oh Lord, in this time of silence, hear our responses, the words of our hearts. Lord, hear our prayers. Amen. We have been reminded this morning that we are in need of help. We are in need of healing. And that comes from our God with everlasting arms. Will you please stand with me and sing hymn number 496, Leaning on the Everlasting Arms.
Let us pray, please. Heavenly Father, Thou has given us so much in this life, skills and abilities to create, to do many things, to raise our family, wisdom to deal with people and to know right from wrong, love that we might find happiness. But please, God, give us one more thing, a grateful heart with a willingness to share with those in need. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Bethsaida, or Bethesda, was exactly the kind of place that you would expect to find Jesus. It was a pool in Jerusalem. Archaeologists have discovered this site, and if you have the opportunity to visit Jerusalem, you can go there and see this pool where the infirmed gathered. It was a pool that was believed to have healing powers. The legend said that an angel would descend occasionally and stir the waters. You may have noticed that as Drew read our text today, he read verses 1 through 3 and verses 5 through 9. 
not skipping verse 4 because in many of our texts, verse 4 does not exist. In the New International Version, as well as the New Revised Standard Version, and in many of the more recent translations, you don't find verse 4. However, if you were reading in the King James, you saw it there. The later translations use older text in translating this passage, texts that were not available when the King James was written. And so they leave this passage out because in the most ancient text, there is no verse 4 there. You might find it in your notes, and it says there in verse 4, the belief that an angel would descend upon these waters from time to time and stir them. And whoever was the first one into the water would somehow be healed of whatever infirmity, whatever disease, whatever problem that they were plagued with. We don't know how often this angel shows up. But evidently, it's with some frequency because John tells us there's a lot of people at this pool. There are a lot of people there all wanting to be healed in some way. I imagine there are all kinds of invalids there. There are the blind, there are the lame, there are the leprous, there are the possessed, and there are those who are crippled and not able to walk. Jesus enters into this scene, walks up onto this porch there at Bethsaida, and he notices one person in particular. Man of compassion that he was, he notices everyone, but he fixes his attention on one particular person. And John tells us perhaps why. He'd been ill, crippled for some 38 years. And it's every reasonable thought to think that many of those 38 years he had spent day in and day out there at the pool, hoping for his opportunity to be healed. He'd been there for a number of years, and chances are he could tell us some wondrous stories about people who were able to slip into the waters once the angel stirred them and came out new, made whole, made well. He could tell those stories, but he didn't have a personal story because he had never been that person. He had never had the privilege of being able to slip in and to find healing. Now, he had likely consulted all the doctors of his day. He had looked into every possible cure, but no one could offer any hope, any relief from his crippled legs. And so the pool was his only hope. So it's no, surprising, no surprise to us that Jesus would go to this man. He is amongst the least of these, and likely be, having been there longer than anyone else, he is probably the very least of the least of these. We can understand Jesus going to this man, but what catches us off guard here is the question that Jesus asks. We would think that Jesus, in all of his compassion and mercy, would approach this man and, and offer a word of compassion, offer a word of encouragement, to give him a blessing of some way. And, and perhaps there is some of that, but, but what catches us off guard here is that Jesus asks a rather obvious question. This man who has hobbled his way down to this pool for 38 years, and Jesus approaches him and says, do you want to be made well? Well, what kind of question is that, Jesus? This man is crippled. He cannot get up on his own. This man has been in this condition for years and years. Isn't it obvious that this man wants to be made well? Jesus is very abrupt here. But this isn't the only time that Jesus asks this question. Think for just a moment of some of the other occasions where Jesus has conversation with people who are ill, maybe not just of body, but of heart or spirit or soul. In nearly every conversation that Jesus has with people, he is always asking them in a round or about way, do you want to be well? Do you want to be made well? 
Do you want to be better than you are today? Peter, for example, Peter had a bad case of no purpose in life. Day in and day out, he dropped his nets in the water and pulled up just enough fish perhaps to sell to make a living and to feed his family. Not much purpose in that other than getting by. But Jesus comes along and says, Peter, do you want to be made well? Do you want to be well so that you can fill your nets, fill your life with people changed lives rather than just fish? Nathaniel is another one. Nathaniel, you read his story in, in the third chapter or so of John. Nathaniel had a fever of cynicism and skepticism. He, he just didn't see much good in anything. And when he heard that the Messiah was from Nazareth, ha, no way, he says. What good can come out of Nazareth? But Jesus comes up to him and says, Nathaniel, you want to be made well? You want to be well so that you can see how close heaven is to earth? You want to be well so that you can see that grace is all around you? You want to be made well? And then there's Martha. Martha has a, a, a bad case of urgency. She thinks that what she is doing is so very urgent. And when Jesus and his disciples come to visit, she doesn't have time to sit down and listen with Mary and the others. She's got work to do. She's got a house to clean. She's got a meal to cook. Everything is so urgent for Mary, Martha. But Jesus comes along and says, Martha, do you want to be made well? Do you want to be made well so that you can see the difference between what's important and what's urgent? And that you can choose what is truly important so that you can sit and rest and be fed a real meal? Do you want to be made well? And then, of course, there were the Pharisees. The Pharisees, they had the, the worst case of all in the other religious authorities. They were crippled by... A system of laws, of rules, of what they should do and what they should not do. They, they couldn't enjoy life at all because of all their laws and their rules. But Jesus comes to them sometimes one by one and other times as groups. And he asks them, do you want to be made well? Do you want to be well? So that you can see that God is not just the God of laws. Do you want to be made well so that you can see what the real purpose of a law is? Do you want to be well so that you can enjoy your faith and not just strain under it? Do you want to be made well? In nearly every conversation that Jesus has, there is the offer, if you listen well enough, for a better life, for a life closer to God. And it's very obvious in today's text, where Jesus asks this most obvious and abrupt question. He approaches this man who has been lame for 38 years, and he asks him point blank, do you want to be made well? I believe Jesus asked the question with this much pointedness. Because Jesus sees something in this man that makes him doubt the man's desire to be made well. I, I think Jesus sees a little bit of Augusta Finch in this fella. Do you remember Augusta Finch? We, we never really met her, but we did hear of her. At least we heard of her demise. Aunt B comes into the courtroom one day. And you can tell by the look on her face that she is all upset. Something terrible has happened in Mayberry. And she comes to see Andy for a few moments. But unfortunately, Andy is not in the courtroom when she walks in. But never worry, Barney is there. No worry, Barney is there. And he tries the best he can to console Aunt B and to, to help relieve her suffering and sorrow. But... 
it's to no of use. Fortunately, Andy comes on in the, to the scene for, in just a moment, and he asks Aunt B, what is wrong? And with a quiver in her lip, she says, I guess you haven't heard the news about Augusta Finch. No, what happened, Andy says. Well, Augusta Finch died this morning at about 10 o'clock. And in his sweet North Carolina drawl, Andy expresses his condolences. I'm so sorry to hear that. But wanting to help Aunt B feel a little bit better, he, he asks a very abrupt question. He says, I, I'm sorry for her death, but I, I don't understand, Aunt B. It's just that you and Augusta weren't the best of friends. Why are you so upset? And Aunt B then confesses that what's really on her mind, what's really got her all upset, is the fact that she and Augusta Finch were the same age. And then we know what she's saying. Because we realize that when one of our contemporaries dies, when one of our friends that we've grown up with dies, we have to swallow a good dose of our own mortality along with the grief. And Andy, still wanting to encourage and to console Aunt B, says, Oh, don't worry about that. It's okay that you all were the same age. But Aunt B, Augusta Finch enjoyed poor health for as long as I knew her. But you're healthy. Augusta Finch enjoyed poor health. And maybe that's what Jesus sees in this fellow. Maybe Jesus sees this fella and he recognizes that this is a guy who simply enjoys poor health. Maybe he's one of those that would rather soak in self-pity than in the healing pool of Bethsaida. Maybe this is a fella who's much more at home sitting on that mat than on two strong legs. Maybe this man's real illness is not crippled legs. Maybe his real illness is self-pity, Jesus thinks. He might not even want to be healed. And as you read the text, you understand that his answer to Jesus doesn't prove otherwise. If one of you had been ill for 38 years and Jesus approached you and asked, do you want to be made, made well? I would think that you would say, absolutely, certainly, just tell me how, Jesus. But that's not what this man says. He doesn't even nod at the idea of being made well. He simply gives an excuse. Do I want to be made well? Well, I'll tell you what, Jesus. I don't have anybody to help me. These waters get stirred from time to time. And there's always someone else who's got a friend that will help them into the waters, but not me. Been here 38 years and not a friend to help me into the waters. Now, Jesus is far more patient than I. He's far more optimistic and hopeful. Because in all honesty, friends, as I've been reading this text over the past few days, I'm having a hard time believing this fella. I have a hard time believing that in 38 years, in 38 years of hobbling down to this pool, in 38 years of illness, in 38 years of not being able to stand up, there's not a soul in Jerusalem that's willing to help this poor soul out. It's at this point in the story that I want to take a time out and I want to stand there with Jesus and say, Jesus, before you heal this guy, before you do anything for him, I, I just would like to ask another question or two. And I want to look at this fellow and I want to say, please help me understand. You say you don't have anyone to help you into the pool, but let me, let me understand, who is it that helps you get this far? Who is it that helps you get to the porch that stands above the pool? Who is it that helps you hobble your way from your home? And who is it that, that gives you a, a little piece of bread or a little bit of money or, or at least a cup of water to sustain you while you can sit here at this pool? 
No one lives as isolated a life as this man thinks that he is living. And so I think he has a plenty of Augusta Finch in him. He's enjoying his poor health. And so forgive me if I'm being too critical. Forgive me if I'm being too judgmental. But in all honesty, friends, I, I just can't help but turn and ask Jesus a question now. I, I've asked this fellow a question, and now I want to ask Jesus a question. Why in the world are you bothering with this man? Why in the world are you giving him your energy, your compassion, your power, your mercy, when it's obvious that he has very little desire to be made well? I realize the man that Jesus is, that he always gravitated towards the very least of these. And this man is indeed the least of the least of these. He's been sick longer than anyone else. And with his attitude, it is certain that he has very few friends. But why are you bothering with this man when it's questionable as to whether he wants to be made well or not? Jesus, look around you. John tells us that the porch is full, that there are people all around you who want to be made well. I realize some of them haven't been sick as long as this guy, but Father, there are good people here who want to do good things for you. So why are you bothering with this guy? Why don't you go heal one somebody else? Why don't you go heal someone like Paul? Now, Paul's not at the pool here, but you remember that Paul prays multiple times, three times, he says, for a thorn to be removed from him so that he can continue to preach and proclaim the gospel, to do good things for God. Why don't you go find someone and heal him or her who will do great things for you, Jesus? Why do you spend your time on someone who may not want to be made well? Better yet, Jesus, while I'm asking, why don't you heal one of us? Why don't you heal one of the good folk here at First Baptist Church in Lumberton? A couple of days ago as I was studying and praying and reading and writing, and studying and praying and reading and writing a little more, and thinking through this text, trying to, to understand what is going on here, my cell phone just continued to go off with texts and phone calls, emails, and other things. I counted up that just within a few hours, I had six or so texts from you, from you people. There I am trying to study the scripture so I can have something to say today. And you are calling me and texting me, not with interruptions, but with pleas. Very important, vital pleas. David, please pray for me. Pray for me, David. Pray that I will be able to get through this day. It's the anniversary of my loved one's death, and I don't know that I can make it. Please pray for me. Tell Jesus I want to be made well. Pray for me, David. My wife and I just got the news that we're going to have to put off our desire to start a family to have children again. Pray for us, David, that we can handle that disappointment. Pray for us. Tell Jesus that we want to be made well. Please pray for me, David. This is an important weekend, and I've got a very, diff or a very important trip to make. Please pray that my family and I will be well enough to travel. Please tell Jesus that I want to be made well. We want to be made well, Jesus. So if Jesus comes walking up to us, 
Or if Jesus comes walking up to me, I can certainly say that on behalf of our congregation, on our family of faith, we certainly want to be made well. So Jesus, why not heal one of us? Why not heal one of us who's struggling with cancer? Why not heal one of us who is struggling with our bodies or with our emotions and our spirits? That's the question that I want to ask Jesus today. And usually I come to you with a question that I have asked God in the course of the week, and, and quite often I've, I come with something of an answer. And I would love to be able to stand here today and tell you that I have the answer to this question. I would love to be able to tell you that I know why Jesus heals this man who seems to not care about being healed while there are those others at the pool and, and those among us who desperately desire healing but yet continue to live on in their sickness. Friends, I assure you I have spent hours and hours listening and reading and writing and praying and thinking and studying, listening for an answer, but I don't have one. I don't have an answer that I can truly hold on to with this story. I've been looking all week, for the past three weeks, trying to find a moral to this story that I can hand to you and say, here you go. Go be made well with this. Go make yourselves well with this truth about God. But it's not there for me. And I'm still struggling with this question, with this story. For there are so many challenges that are difficult to overcome with how this story unfolds. And the best I can tell you today, friends, is that that may indeed be the moral of the story. The moral of the story may be for us to remember that God's ways are not our ways. And that Jesus heals who Jesus is going to heal. The Lord heals those the Lord is going to heal. Not only in the days of scripture, but in our day as well. And the only word that we have in the matter is simply yes. The first sermon that I shared with you as your pastor I told you that my purpose as your pastor was simply to help you to say yes to God. That when God calls your name, that when God appears to you, that when God speaks to you, the answer is always yes. To help you say yes to God's gift of salvation, but to help you say yes to God's gift of life in the every moments and days of our lives. Perhaps that's our only word. That when Jesus comes to us and asks if we want to be made well, all we can say is yes. For if we take this story on its own, then we have some difficulties when it comes to how Jesus heals. Because this story by itself would tell us that healing is an instantaneous event. At once the man stood up and went his way. And we would also have to confront the idea that healing is offered regardless of desire. That Jesus heals any and everyone regardless of their want to. But this is not the only healing story in the scripture. And we have to take it in balance with all the others. And when we do that, we realize that more often than not, healing takes time. It doesn't happen all at once. Sometimes it takes a lifetime. And that healing also is built on the desire of the infirmed. But most importantly, we have to understand that healing is not always what we think it is. We think this man was healed because he stood up and walked. 
But if we read on through this text, we see that he still has some problems with responsibility and with accountability. And we also know that there are plenty of those within our family of faith and plenty of those within our congregation whose bodies are not as strong as ours, but yet their spirits and their souls are filled with power, are filled with love. And in many ways, they are more well than we are. And if we take this story in balance with all the others, then we simply have to give ourselves to the faith that when we say with the ancient, all shall be well, all shall be well, and all manner of things shall be well, that that includes us as well. That we will one day, maybe in this life, but certainly in the life to come, we will all be well. Will you pray with me? Merciful God, we bow as an infirmed people. We may be able-bodied. We may be strong and able to stand on two legs and go and come as we please. But Father, we all have our insecurities, our hurts. We all have our wounds. And so you ask us the same question. In the sanctity of the devotion, as well as in grand moments of epiphany, you come to us and ask, do you want to be made well? And Lord, you mean the question. And you expect us to take some responsibility for our own health. Our health and well-being, O oh Lord, is a gift of grace. But it is one we must be willing to receive. It is one we must be willing to live. So help us, Lord, to prayerfully consider your question. And to be able to reach a point of saying yes. It's in the name of the one who said yes to coming to make us well that we pray. Amen. O Christ, the healer, we have come. We have come to this pool, this pool of the church on this Sunday in hopes of being made well. If you would accept Jesus' invitation to be made well of heart or of spirit, or to pray for the Lord to make you well of body or of mind, then I invite you to come and to pray and to receive God's grace. Let's stand together as we sing.